Okay, we're gonna get started. Um, I'm, I'm a big believer in starting on time, so give these guys as much time as possible. So really appreciate all you guys coming into this session. Um, my name is Nancy Lobby. I work for the Nature Conservancy. This is a topic that's at the top of our minds as an organization because the rancher is aging. And I think the average age of the rancher now is like 60 years old. And so we need that next generation to be coming back to the ranch. So the, the yeah, <laughs> you are. <laughs> so it's really, really important that um, we have these conversations. Uh, I do a lot of work with the Nebraska Grazing Land Coalition that is really focused on this. And so as a grazing lands coalition, if you need um, advice on how to do this well, Pam is a great resource. Tim is a great, great resource. That grazing, Vern is a great resource for that. So um, I would encourage you to, to reach out to those folks for a program that works really, really well. So with that, we're gonna get started with our first speaker. Um, Bill is gonna come up and talk with us. Uh, he is the uh, owner and operator of Barbie Bar Ranch. Um, him and his wife, Debbie. The ranch has been in the family for 50 years and under Bill's management since uh, 2007. It's located along the Cimarron River in southeast Clark in southwest Comanche counties in Kansas. There's 11 different ecological sites along uh, with 200 different types of grasses and forbs that have been identified on the ranch. It's a cow-calf operation with calves retained and marketed as all natural for a premium. Debbie was an RN for 40 years before retiring. Thank you very much, Debbie. Um, she's currently focused on health, grandchildren, and traveling. Good for you. In addition to the ranch, Bill is past chairman of Kansas Grazing Lands, vice chairman of Kansas Prescribed Burn Association, chairman of Cherokee Strip PBA, which I don't know what that stands for, and on the Wafwa Advisory Committee and also local church board. So join me in welcoming Bill up here for this presentation. Thank you, Nancy. It's good to be here. It sounds like I'm, I'm past the uh, average age, but I guess that's why we're here talking about this. Above <laughs> average. Above average, yeah. Um, well, as Nancy said, our ranch is in, I was going to have Debbie stand up first to recognize her. <laughs> thank, thank you. Uh, our ranch is in southwest Kansas, and we're down near the Oklahoma border, state line. And we're in Cimarron River, and it's a mid-grass prairie. Uh, I grew up on a 35,000-acre family ranch, so I basically just ranched my entire life. Um, the first ranch that my wife and I bought we were early adapters to cell grazing, um, and resting the grass and soil health. Um, we were doing one day moves with high stock densities 35 years ago. It wasn't very common back then. Conservation is at the heart of our ranch management. Um, we have several conservation aspects that, that we're wanting to uh, have maintained on the ranch. We worked long and hard to get rid of all the eastern red cedar on the on the ranch and and this summer you know you always miss a few when you do that and you drive by them for years and go yeah i need to cut that one down but you don't do it well this summer we went back and found every stray one that we missed and cut them down so to my knowledge we're cedar tree free right now and might be some little uh, you know seedlings coming up in the grass but hopefully we'll get those taken care of with our burning and then the tamarisk or salt cedar along the river, we're, uh, we're working on that right now with a project, five-year equip, to, uh, to t get that taken out. And so we'll have, have a lot more grass. And so we want to we see this, this maintained, and we want to see prescribed fire used as a tool on the ranch. To, we want to see that continue. The ranch has 26 paddocks for adapted grazing to maintain the soil health. And the, it gives the grass 90% rest, and it's allowed us to increase our stocking rate by 40%. And so right now we're going to a one herd, and you know we always tried to have one herd, but you know you always got some heifers that you're breeding, or you're getting ready to calve, and you got some bulls. And so anyway, we've taken all those off the ranch with our transition to one of his other ranches. 
So we can just focus on having one big herd there and that's gonna increase our efficiency some more. So once we get out of the drought that we're starting to slide into right now, we think that we'll be able to double our initial stocking rate from where we started at. Um, so our genetics are adapted to the environment uh, for our area and low input management is used with them. So I'm 68 years old and I'm wanting to get out of the day-to-day -day labor. Uh, I'm not necessarily wanting out of the cattle business or the land business, but in other words, we don't want to sell the ranch, but we don't want to continue to work so hard either. Uh, as Nancy mentioned, Debbie's been retired. Uh, she retired four years ago. She's been waiting on me so we can have the freedom to go see the grandchildren and more often and travel while we're still in good health. Um, three years ago, we set up a five, went into a five-year plan. And that, so our goal was to get the succession completed within that five-year period of time. Uh, I, I would be 70 then. And at first, we th thought there was a chance that one of our sons would come home. And five children, and, and uh, one, one was interested in it. He was young in his career, and we thought he might come back. He showed interest. We held on to that hope perhaps longer than we should have. Uh, we accepted it was him, him and his wife's choice, whether they came back or not. And, but it was still a tough pill to swallow when, when he didn't. So we set out to find a non-family member uh, to succession our operating business to. And so we needed the right person for our belief system to continue our vision and maintain our ecological goals for the land. Finding that right person or couple with a necessary skill set that, that was like-minded was important to us. Them having good ecological practices to keep the grass and the soil healthy, that was important. So we got involved in groups teaching succession planning. One such group included six ranch couples from the Kansas Livestock Association. They, they'd signed up to be part of a succession pilot program. We were part of that. It consist, consisted of a Zoom call once a month, and we had a facilitator, a professional facilitator that did this for a business, and he'd done it for a long time and, and that, that, that very well thought of. So each month he had different speakers and different topics, and the program was a good experience for us. It gave us the basis to, to go forward with and, and know what steps we needed to take. So when it came time to go find that person, we decided that the ranch management consultants was the group that we wanted to focus on. They have a school called, called Ranching for Profit, and then they have an, a business arm of that called Executive Link. And if you have to complete the school before you can go to Executive Link. So we went to the school. You know, I, I went to it with, um, um, what is his name? not Alan Savory, but Stan Parsons back, you know, 30 years before that. But I, I went to a three day deal and I didn't go to the whole week long school. So they said, you know, I'd have to go retake the school. So we went, went to that and then. We got out of that and, and got into their executive link. And that's basically a peer board and they'll have six businesses in, in a, in, on a board and you help each other set, set goals and write, make action plans and hold each other accountable. And we get, you know, we get involved in each other's business and to every degree, the finances and every, every aspect of it. So we, we got involved with that and we became associated with people who fit our goals. And I was beginning to have some health issues along the way that slowed me down. I had a knee replacement in 2017 and then last year I had uh, cancer in one of my kidneys and it had to be removed. And so that, that was a pretty good wake up call then. I, I remember when I was younger, my, my plans was I thought, well, at 75, I'll retire. 
Well, first I just thought one, one day I just won't come home, and then I thought, no, they're a set of goals, 75. And I thought, well, that's not a very good plan. So, you know, I wanted to be able to do the things that Debbie enjoyed as well. And after I had that cancer and went through that, I realized it was time to, to you know, get this wrapped up and get it done. And I told my son when he's thinking about coming back, I said, we can, we can go, you know, I can accelerate this as fast as we want to, or I can slow this down. But when he wasn't coming, then I just I, we just set out to go find that person. Um, and you know, so I was realizing I couldn't keep up with every, everything that I had to do. And we invited a young couple out from Nebraska. Uh, they came out and spent some time with us and looked at the ranch and we talked and they were interested and, and it just drug on for about six months and wasn't going anywhere and finally one day he called and said he'd taken a job at a large ranch up in Nebraska. And so we moved on and it was in February of this year we were in Arizona snowbirding for a while and a, a couple who lives about an hour southeast of us down in Oklahoma called about some cattle that we had on one of their ranches. We, we were on the same executive link board the year before and they'd been on in, involved in that for several years and then they, they got out of it and and they, they called to talk about something about the cattle and it was during that conversation that the idea came up that we would ask them if they'd be interested in taking our operating business. And they wanted to talk to us more when we got home. And that sounded fine. Well, then about 15 minutes, he called back. And he said, I just want you to know something. Uh, my, my wife and I have been praying daily about an opportunity like this. I hung up and told Debbie, I said, yep. I think they're the ones. Uh, they, they have the desire to expand, the experience to succeed, a team in place to take over, and they're constantly learning. And we like them a lot. <laughs> we, we had a number of meetings, and then it kind of slowed down and got to dragging along. And, and he was still, you know, encouraging to you know, have meetings, let's do that. And I, had, I had to be honest with myself. I, I realized what was happening. I got cold feet. I wasn't wanting to let go. I loved the ranch. I loved what I did. I knew it was inevitable. And, I, and so I was, I was in the way. My wife recognized it. She was, she was praying to get my eyes open and was out there. The hot summer days came and one day we were having more troubles. I mean, we always got problems, but we were, we were having more trouble with things going south and she looked at me and told me she'd been praying about that and I said, stop it. <laughs> I said, I get it. I know what we need to do. So we got, we got back involved having, having the meetings with them and set goals and, and started, started moving forward. We uh, continued to talk in, in August of this year, they took over operations and then on September 22nd, after we preg checked the bread heifers, we signed the, the contracts and shook hands on the hard transfer. They began billing us for the cattle care and, and they began paying us for the lease. We, we believe they respect us and we respect and appreciate them. They talked to us about changes in their operation. We've, you know, we talked about the grazing plan and breeding dates and, and you know, they're, they're, they're seeing some things that we do that they like, that they're changing on their entire operation. They've got four ranches. Um, and, and things like adding the value, such as how we retain our calf crop through the feed yard and, and sell them all natural for a premium. They've started doing that too. And we feel like we're a team because basically we are. Their success and profitability is important to us and our desire to do all we can to help them succeed. Um, we, we have, and our, our success and profitability is important to them too. They, they, want, they want this to be successful and they want to see us succeed as well and be profitable. We have cattle on three of their four ranches and we talked often and, and very openly. 
Um, we're separating the land business from the operating business by forming two separate LLCs, and we'll keep ownership of the land. We have our state plan in place, and we currently own all the cattle. But they'll begin buying a percentage of our cows each year on an annual basis, and they've purchased most of our machinery. And we we didn't we didn't have a lot of machinery, but. Uh, they they had a use for it, and so we're they pretty much fixed it where I can't come back at all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know if that's their plan or not. I go out there and I look, and I just don't see anything. I'm like, wow. But but I'm but I'm free to come and be involved as I want to be. Uh, you know, I'll saddle up and help him rotate sometimes, or sometimes I'll do it for him and. Uh, and we're, we're real involved and real engaged, you know, about talking about things. And so, you know, I'm welcome to be around. And, and uh, I know they'll treat the land like they own it and love it. Uh, you know, we don't know if we found them or if they found us. But actually, it was totally a God thing because he's always in control. Thank you for listening. I'm going to run through just a few slides on the ranch. The picture you're looking at is this, just a photo I thought was just beautiful. Um, you can you can see the, in the background, you can see the canyons going up to the upland and you can see some of the, the brush, the salt cedar. Um, this is my dad in, in later years and me in younger years, but he, you know, he started it all. He bought that ranch in 1967 uh, the picture up there in the in the right um, that was on the cover of Beef Magazine one time when they did an article on him. He he was a he was a great cattleman and a, a great rancher. And this is Cimarron River. It runs five miles through our property. It, it begins in Eagles Nest Lake in northeast New Mexico, and it runs to Keystone Lake near. Tulsa, 698 miles long, and it supplies water for Tulsa. There's 26 paddocks on the ranch. They, they range in size from 62 acres to 200 acres. The, the bigger ones we intend to get divided up some more. Here's a picture of rotating pastures. I'm coming out of the sand hills and down into the river bottom. You see my little dog in the bottom left corner? She's doing all the work. I'm just sitting on the horse taking pictures. Here we're just grazing on some uplands. You can see the, the horizon in the distance. Uh, so it's, it's our river bottom area that's, that's in the middle. I just stored it. My cows don't look like that. I just stored that picture trying to make it bigger for my PowerPoint. Uh, but the point is that we calve on green grass, not in the middle of the winter. Um, you can see the canyons behind us going going up top. And so, you know, we, we calved in May and June for a long time. And, you know, we're breeding in August and things just never were working very well and so I figured out I, I need to get my first heat cycle on green grass before the grass quality turns bad and 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 now it, it, everything's just working better we have all solar water out there we don't have any electricity on the ranch we actually got one one windmill that we use but uh, everything's solar and a, a lot of them are on the pipeline using gravity flow. This is our Nancy, the PBA's Prescribed Burn Association. Um, so about 10 years ago, I, I formed one for our area. We're not quite in burn culture. A little further east where they have more cedars, they're, they're used to burning. Of course, you get into Flint Hills, they, they, they burn every year. But we were really out where nobody did it. And I realized how important it was for all of our woody species. Um, so we formed it just with neighbor helping neighbor. Um, 
now we've got an, an, enough. Um, we got nine ranches involved. We we got an, enough to you know, do our own burns. Once I got some of the big ranches on board, they quit thinking that I was just an idiot. And it must be the good thing to do now that the, the big guys are doing it. So it's it's been a fun journey, and and here we're just going along, lighting the backfire. After we started burning, we see the difference. So we had a field day and people out. So in this particular pasture is a sand hill pasture and the salt, or I mean the sand sage was big. It's about the size of a cabin pickup in some places. Big old stalks, no grass underneath it. And so our target there was to, to burn that. You can see how little the sage is now. And it's small, it's growing, growing up vegetatively. The grass is coming in around it. Uh, where before there's a lot of bare soil. And in that picture, we got sand blue stem, uh, one of our you know, real good grasses. So it's really healthy. So you could look across the fence line at one of my other pastures, and it was managed well. The grass was healthy there, but it's a night and day difference. You look at that, you used to walk up on that hill and, and look at the contrast. And if you didn't believe in prescribed burning, you would after you saw that. 2017, March of 2017, the Starbucks wildfire, the largest wildfire in history of Kansas, came and burned our entire ranch, 100% of it, burned 500,000 acres. Here, I'm, I just got through moving my yearling cattle a mile or so over to my neighbor's wheat field. We, we don't farm or anything like that, but it was one of those deals, life or death, and I didn't ask for permission. I just went over there and put them on it. I was kind enough to go down and open the gate and bring uh, one of his herds of cows and calves up and put them on it as well, because they were surely gonna die in the fire if I wouldn't have. When I got done, I was really wondering if I could get out of there, and and I and I did. and. So I'm back up by the headquarters, and my brother's cows, he's across the fence from me, they had their tails up, and they were running from this fire, and the calves were running with them. And so we opened the gate and went out and got them, brought them into a little uh, area there that didn't have enough grass to burn, and, and basically just saved them. Uh, sadly, some of the calves turned around and ran back before they into the fire. This is what it looked like a week or so afterwards. You see they're getting a little green in the river bottom. I think we might have had a little rain. You can see the river there. And, and a lot of that brush before was 100% canopy. I mean, it just annihilated it. Um, and, and then, of course, all the sand was bare. It was a pretty ugly time, but it, it came back. Well, here's Jesse, the guy I'm transitioning to where we just finished preg checking the bread heifers and shook hands and he's taken over. Thank you very much. So anybody have questions they would like to ask Bill or Debbie, either one? We have about five minutes. If there's no questions, we'll have some time at the end. But if anybody's got a burning question, yeah, Tim. Yeah, Bill, quick question. Um, so the, the young man you gave the, the burning to, what was his name? Did you have any agreement with? How did you get financing? Because you would hold the collateral, meaning the land and the equipment. Well, they, they had 24,000 acres they, uh, already. They, they've been in business for 20 years. They, they're well, well established. Uh, I finance the machinery for him. The, the cattle, I will finance for him some, but we not just right at first because of cash flow reasons, but uh, so we're helping him in areas like that that we can. But uh, so, and they're buying part of that ranch, one, one ranch one one came from his wife's side and the other from his mother's side and they're starting to buy one of those so they they needed another income stream for them to to accomplish all this and and this this is going to help them do that so if you'd have had a young couple that didn't were not established 
and would you have been willing to carry some of that back to help them get established in the finance situation? Probably if they didn't have any experience, I wouldn't have even been talking to them. We, we wanted somebody that was successful. Not, I, I wasn't interested in bringing somebody out of college and staying there mentoring them and financing them. No, I, I was not interested. Too selfish, I guess. But you're going to keep control of the land. It's not a conservation easement as far as we, trust. We, we are in the process of doing a conservation easement with t Nature Conservancy now. It'll be done in the next year or so. Um, but we are keeping ownership of the land. We have no plans to sell it. Um, and we currently own all the cattle, but as he starts buying into them, I won't even have some skin in the game. I don't, and, but so eventually he'll own all the cattle. And, but, you know, I mean, he, he said at any point if we want, you know, to, to get back into more ownership, you know, he, he'll work with us on that. So we, we think we have a very good relationship. Is there any assurance that the family won't sell the land later? After, after I'm gone, uh, well, uh, that'd be after I'm gone and Debbie's gone. I mean, hopefully that's down the road 20 plus years. Um, there's no guarantee that the children won't sell it. But we're going to do everything we can. I feel like we're setting them up for success right. by them not having to be concerned about the ranch. They can go up and hunt on it and enjoy it and ride horses, whatever they want to do. And, and they can have income from it and it'll already be set up where they don't have to worry about it. Because they wouldn't have probably known what to do. We've got time for about one more question. Anybody have a burning question? If not, um, I'm sure Bill will be around afterward and yes. you can corner him afterward. Thank, thank you. Let's give him a round of applause. There's one thing that I've learned um, in this process that, as Tim would say, this is a, it's a raw emotional sort of um, undertaking that folks are, are doing here. And so I commend all of the folks that are, that are sharing their stories and, and just being really frank and open because it's really important um, for those that have not uh, started down this, this path. So with that, I'm going to introduce um, Jerry Doan. Uh, I told Jerry I could pro probably just give this presentation for him because I've seen it so many times. Um, Jerry and his wife Renee own and operate Black Leg Ranch along with their families. He's going to talk about the history of that ranch um, as part of his presentation, so I'm, I'm not going to uh, spoil it for him. Um, he's currently chairman of the North Dakota Grazing Lands Coalition, and he's also a mentor. He's uh, the governor. He's also uh, governor appointed to the Natural North Dakota the Natural Resources Trust Board. He's on the board of the Partnerscapes Group and an advisory board member of the Nature Conservancy. Um, Jerry has, has won all kinds of awards, um, including the North Dakota, North Dakota Environmental Stewardship Award. He was the inaugural winner of the Leopold Award in North Dakota, along with the, uh, the National Environmental Stewardship Award winner um, for NCBA. So if you've never been to his operation, it's, it's really unique and quite a place. So I encourage you. I'm inviting everybody to your house, Jerry. Um, Black, Black Lake Ranch was inducted into the 2020 inducted in 2020 into the North Dakota Cowboy Hall of Fame. And Jerry's been very active on a state and national level um, as an advocate for agriculture. And there's one thing I know about Jerry. He does not like the word sustainable. So it's regenerative agriculture is what he's really a proponent for. So Jerry, um, why don't you come up and give your talk. Excuse me. Well, thanks, Nancy. and. Uh, I really appreciate being here and seeing a lot of good friends and uh, visiting with everybody and learning some things along the way here. So uh, we'll, uh, <clears throat> we're going to talk about this a little bit in a little different way because one of the things, we're a holistically managed operation and one of the things that we, uh, two of our main holistic goals, bringing profitability back and improving our quality of life. And quite honestly, I don't think any of my kids would have came home if we didn't do that. They weren't going to do it the way, uh, <clears throat> the way we did it. I'll uh, 
this was picture in 1889, that's Sod House. My great grandfather came down out of, he was Canadian citizen, 1880 he came down out of Canada, went to Kansas first and for some godly reason he went back to, went to <laughs> what was then Dakota Territory and he homesteaded there in 1882. And so anyway, in the background is the Sod House and I say as crazy as the world is right now, I, I have to think about that because it can't be as bad as trying to stay warm and put food on the table in the northern plains, so you gotta keep it into perspective a, a bit. Just a shot if you come to the, our place now, and this is the family, uh, and my wife Renee is right there, Renee, if you wanna wave your hands. <laughs> Renee had a terrible summer. She got bucked off a horse on, on, uh, in June and spent eight days in the hospital, broke four vertebrae, so it's, it's good to see her out and about and keeping me in line again. So it's crazy things happen on ranches, as you guys all well know. Nancy was uh, recovering a little at the same time, so I was harassing her about we're going to put them both in a rubber room. <laughs> anyway, uh, my daughter Shanda's on the left, my oldest boy Jeremy in the front, uh, my wife Renee and I in the back, my middle son and Jay on the front, and then on the far right's the youngest boy, and he's... Uh, Jace, and uh, <clears throat> what's really odd about our place, I guess, and yet we're really proud of it, is all three boys came back to the ranch. My daughter is involved some, not directly involved, and uh, as you know, the family dynamics, particularly when they all get married and all those sorts of things, are a bit interesting, and the least thing I was prepared for, I guess, and uh, I just try to keep them from killing each other some days. <laughs> so we'll talk about that a bit as we move on here. But uh, I, how to bring the next generation back to the ranch, right? It's, it's a challenge. And as I get out around the country speaking, and I, I told Bill this story, and I said, don't get offended, Bill. But sometimes people will come up, Dad will come up. I didn't get any of the kids to come home, and after I talked to them for five minutes, I know why they didn't go back there. You know, there was nothing positive. It was all negative. And I mean, it's easy for us to get into that mindset of being negative and egg, and particularly on ranches, but if we're gonna do that and expect the kids to come home, they're not. And for me, you know, agriculture is so traditional, and, and young people today are not very. <laughs> And if you stay that way, they're not going to be very happy. I just, I know, and at least from my experience, you're shaking your head, right? The 80s were telling to me, if I take six operations I really admired in the 80s, none of them are in business. None of them. The ones that I thought, God, they've got it made, they got it figured out. And I tell my kids that all the time because it's scary to me, and, and you don't want to be that like that. But the journey to bring in profitability back, and I won't spend a lot of time on this or, or the whole ranch system, but I wanted to just touch on some things that really were key to us. You know, no secret, get rid of those high cost operations. And we're gonna talk quite a bit about stacking enterprises and diversity. You know, in agriculture, we've generally become non-diverse. You know, if you're a wheat farmer, that's what you do. If you're a cow guy, you just kind of zeroed in on cows and in, in our place we went just exactly the opposite way and brought diversity back. And then we look at production per acre, not production per animal. The systems we're using in agriculture and promoting generally will make you go bankrupt. And it's just, it's the truth. I lived it half my life. I know better. <clears throat> um, you know, we've been no-till for 25 years. Uh, we try to, in the crop rotation, keep all four crop types. We use a lot of cover crops. We're building soil health. Regenerative agriculture is exciting. It's partially why my kids are there, the excitement of it. The old style wasn't very exciting, you know, and I'm not trying to pick on the older generations, but this is more exciting. <laughs> well, it's right. And then limit risk. And I tell young people, don't go buy the cows custom graze. I would have never done that 25 years ago. I wouldn't because I had to own everything. I had to manage everything. I was like my youngest son who would just soon have one fence around the whole ranch and ride a horse across it all day long. So I have to keep re-educating him every day. But we do. We have our own cow herd, but we custom graze a lot of cattle and it limits our risk and it spreads our risk. And so it's a good thing, particularly for people starting out. 
and then make every acre profitable if you can. That's really what saved me through the 80s because we were, our equity, we had equity, but we were losing our hind end going through it. And I finally beat my head against the wall one day and said, I don't care what it's going to take. Whatever it is, I'm going to make every acre on this ranch profitable. And I did. First thing I did was I rented out a bunch of farm ground. What did the neighbors think? He's going broke. <laughs> but it was the smartest decision I ever made because it made me do something different. And then that money or that land actually didn't lose money for the first year and probably 10 or so. So it was a good thing. And then seriously, try to invest outside of ag. I watched my dad and my grandpa. You have all that equity and all your money in all those assets of that ranch. And then when retirement time comes, you have no way to do it if you're bringing the next generation back. And so we've tried to do that, Renee and I. And so we've been able to invest some dollars outside so we're not dependent as we turn that over to steal everything out of that operation. I just encourage that. And we, we usually aren't very good at that because there's always something you can spend it on within your operation. But you've got to fight that and, and honestly do that. And, and we're, we're lucky we have. Changes that really made a difference in the profitability of the cattle operation. It's changed, and Bill talked about the calving date. It was huge. I fought that, you know, I, I used to think it was fun when I was young, getting up in the middle of the night and calving in barns. And we lost 100 calves of scours one year, pulling them through the muck and everything. And, and uh, when I decided I had to change, because I'd lost my dad, my hired man been with me for 15 years, were gone, my kids were still in school, and I said, I'm either going to quit or something's got to change. And, you know, I, I'm a graduate at NDSU in animal science, so I called the head of the animal science department, and I said, give me all the research on uh, later calving. I got a half a page. <laughs> you don't ever look at this stuff, <laughs> you know? And, and I'm not trying to be overly critical to him, but it's the truth. And so one day again, I went over and beat my head against the wall <laughs> and said, I got to do something different. The number one best economics decision, that was 20 some years ago, that I ever did to that ranch, changed that calving date. It's fun. Quality of life went up, profitability went up, and, and uh, it's a no-brainer to me. I'd never go back. They'd never convince me that was good. And then bringing the cow size in. As we try to graze cover crops, our goal is to never feed a bale of hay to a cow in the Northern Plains. We also know it's the Northern Plains. You've got to have a backup plan for that. But we've done it through 200-inch 200 200 snowfall years, never fed a bale of hay. But we also have had some where you got 75 inches and in, excuse me in three weeks and three major blizzards and lost some cattle and you better have a backup plan for those things so you can't just you either got to buy some hay or, or keep some haying equipment or those types of things but I can tell you bring when we graze those cover crops and build that soil health you've got to have the right cattle type and if you can do it with 1800 pound cows God bless you I can't I need 1,150 pound cow to make this work. And then it works. And then true profitability comes. And then we can do all these things and get rid of those winter feed costs. And the other big thing for us is plan rotational grazing. It's made a huge difference in our natural resources. That's big blue stem going up. We're just six, uh, five miles or so off the Missouri River in south central North Dakota, uh, southeast of Bismarck, just on the east side of the river. A lot of sandy, hilly ground. When I was a kid, there was no grass on that. Bare soil, lots of erosion from season-long grazing. That's big blue stem, and people will come there and see that and say, what'd you plant that with? Oh, John Deere air seeder. <laughs> no, the seed bank was there. We just ran a lot of cattle on there, short time, and got them off and let that rest and recovery. I never dreamed it would look like that, that big blue stem would come back. And, and then you get diversity of lots of forbs and lots of other grasses. But it, it's, it, so you talk about excitement. That's what excites you when you see those sorts of things. No, there was nothing. And this is, uh, we plant at least 22 species in our cover crops. This is a shot of it. And then we winter graze this stuff. Uh, the things I really like for winter grazing are like forage collards. You know, it's a a leafy plant without a cabbage, it's kind of like cabbage plant without the, the head. And then several kinds of millets in there. We put a lot of legumes in there because we don't fertilize. We're trying to keep these costs down. And it really is improving our soil health. 
We test our biology every year. Our, our soil biology is going like that, which is bringing that organic matter back. And I, I won't spend a whole bunch of time on that. This isn't a soil health uh, presentation, but I, I've, I'm, I'm a firm believer we can really make a difference. This is winter grazing. Uh, because of our hunting operation, we run strips in them because nowadays we have lazy hunters and they want breaks in the fields. <laughs> and so, uh, but, but that's what it looks like in a, in a normal year, which none of them are normal. So you go from one extreme to the other. But, but we can graze those things all winter long and generally meet the requirements of the cattle. But if we can't, we never bring those cattle into the riparian and the watershed area, which most headquarters of the ranch are built on. And ours is the same that drains to the Missouri. And I never thought about that until we started doing this. And why do we do that? and then wonder why people don't like us that much. So we need to pay attention to that. And so now, we keep them out on the land. We take, if we need to put hay or supplement out there, it's out there. We're building that soil health back, and we're getting rid of a problem in that water. Okay, the, what I wanted to talk quite a bit about is, when you're gonna bring these kids back, what's gonna excite them? And it's some, you know, it's, Ranching, they love all that, but stacking enterprises and give them some creativity and give them some ideas, add some income, make these things work. And then the hardest for all of us, get out of the way. <laughs> it was not exactly easy for me as well. I think I'm halfway <laughs> progressive in that, but there's times when they come with some crazy thing and I'm like, Oh, no. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> but it's been fun, and, and it creates excitement for us as well. This, is a, this was the original ranch house after the sod house. Came, it was a Sears and Roebuck kid house. Came in on the Sioux Line Railroad, a little town of Britain, which is ghost town on the ranch. Several generations have lived in that, and when the boys started the hunting operation, they needed a liquor license and a commercial kitchen, and they said, Dad, I think we're gonna tear down the ranch house and build a nice big lodge. And I said, you'll lose all that history. My dad was born on the kitchen table in there. He died 80 years later, 10 feet away on the couch. My grandpa died in that house. There was hired men lived in the upstairs, countless stories, and when folks come there, they love to hear that history. So I talked them into it. I'd never do it. I'd never be able to do it again because they jacked it up. They straightened it out. They rebuilt it, and it's beautiful facility. We call it our Grand Lodge, and and lots of good things happen there. This is the inside set up for hunting on the right, and and there was an event out front there, and and uh, and uh, lots of stuff goes on there, and and it's uh, it's a fun thing. This is. Our hunting operation, Rolling Plains Adventures, and uh, <clears throat> well, I'll get to the next slide, talk a little about it. It's pheasant hunting, it's both ducks and geese, waterfowl, it's white-tailed deer, it's mule deer, coyote hunts, buffalo hunts, and uh, we've had people from all 50 states there. It's nationally acclaimed, it's been on most of the hunting shows now. The way our place is set up, is one of my boys is in charge of each operation. We run as a whole business structure, but they're in charge. So Jeremy, my oldest boy, this is his baby. And we're just coming towards the end of hunting season. It's been really busy, but really good because we had the worst drought in North Dakota's history. And so again, agriculture ain't that great, but these things are doing good and helping us along. That's a 1959 white, and uh, it sits in the yard now. They're kind of using it as an ornament, and it's kind of a cool truck. I can tell you some great stories of riding as a little kid in that hauling hay from way off. So, That's the front of the lodge on a, after a pheasant hunt. This was the day we left Sunday, and, and you, I don't know for whatever reason that slide's cut off. Anyways, a whole row of geese there. They, they, uh, they hunted on the Missouri that day, and... Hunters had a ball, you know, and so it's, it's a good thing. You know what's fun about this? You meet a lot of great people, and they're successful people 
with a good attitude about America, because I can get really down on where we're going and how things are going, and then I come home and I tell Renee, gosh, there's still hope. There's still good people out there. And they, even from some of the states we think are a little wacky, you know, but there's still good people there. <laughs> I don't have to tell you. I'm going to get in trouble here. Somebody will be from there, you know. <laughs> My wife's nodding at me. Yeah, okay. Uh, we, do, we, we do these buffalo hunts, and it's been a lot of fun, and it's really kind of growing. And, and uh, you know, it's pretty rustic on the south part of the ranch, and uh, there's two flowing creeks and a lot of Indian history there, and, and folks come, and, and uh, there's some good stories told, and, and uh, we have fun with it. So then that led into um, our meats business. And when Jace, come, Jace went to Montana State, uh, Jeremy went to NDSU like I did. Jace went to Montana State. He's a cowboy, and he, he was on their rodeo team there. But when he came back, Every one of them come back and said, what are you bringing to the table? If you want to be here, you got to bring something. And, and we really thought we could do something with this, you know, farm to fork type thing, ranch to fork. I never, I'm not the greatest farmer even though we have some cropland. So we're Audubon certified. We went through the Audubon certification process. I still have a lot of hope in that process. There's a million and a half Audubon men, members, and if they just get them to eat it, we'd have it made. <laughs> There's still a lot of them want to get rid of it. You know, that's the problem. Some education's got to be done. They still think the cattle are, not all of them, but there are some that think the cattle are ruining the planet. And so I still have a lot of hope for it. I, I was on the uh, steering committee that put that together, and I, I, I really believe in it, but it's got some issues. Anyway, both uh, uh, grass-finished beef and grass-finished, and, and we can call them, I like the term buffalo, that's what the Indians use, but bison's the correct term, so we use them both a bit, and I don't want to get into the argument over it. <laughs> Just a shot of uh, some of the buffalo up on the, on the bluff there. Bunch of grass-finished cattle. I mean, these are cows and heifers and stuff, but that's what we do. And then some of our products there, uh, it, there's a food co-op in Bismarck, North Dakota, and, and that's our display in the corner, some of the jerky and things. And, and uh, I think it has a tremendous amount of potential. You know, we're just scratching the surface yet, but something good's got to come out of the pandemic. The pandemic showed us America's not very healthy. There's a vast segment of the younger population just yearning to get to a producer and start feeling a relationship. And I think the product's got to be good, but I think the story is even more important than the product. And they want to hear the story. And if we tell them that what we're doing for the natural resources of this country and how we can sequester carbon and how we can improve the, you know, we don't need to get into politics of climate change. Let's just do the right thing and then we can sell that story. And, and I think we'll have it made. Just a quick shot. Uh, Nancy's giving me high signs over here on time, so I'm trying to move a bit here. So this is Jace just cooking up. We have a lot of events there and frying up some stuff and, and always fun. And, and then it took us to Black Leg events. My middle son went to Arizona State. He was the rebel. Don Land Grant University, biggest party school in the country, so they told me. <laughs> he said he went for academics. I don't buy it. <laughs> anyway, he... He went to work outside of that. Uh, John McCain's wife had, has the biggest Anheuser-Busch distrib distributorship there, Hensley. He worked for them. They recruited him, took him to Austin, Texas, worked for the Anheuser-Busch brewery. He absolutely had it made, never paid for anything in his life, had a credit card. You could, yeah, the most fun, you'd go downtown with him, and he knew everybody, and everybody loved you because it was all free drinks. All day long. <laughs> so it was a lot of fun. But one day he called home, and he said, uh, Tired of the traffic, I'm tired of the people, I'm tired of the crime, I miss the ranch, I want to come home. We said, what are you smoking? <laughs> you <know? laughs> so I never dreamed he'd come back. So that creates issues, how do you fit another one, and yet excitement that it's fun to have him back. And so Black Leg Events was formed. This is a barn on our place that's made into an event center now. You know, I had to get out of the way. 
He wanted it for three years before I gave in on it. We were still using it a bit, not very much, but it was, we were putting feed and stuff in there, and I said, no, no, no. <laughs> and finally, I'm like, God, I got to give in. I got to let them go. I got to let them create. So this is a wedding with dueling pianos inside, and, you know, we do lots of soil health tours, lots of grazing tours, lots of education. We had Alan Savory do a big school in there. And then we got into the wedding thing, which all summer long, there's a wedding every weekend, and, and uh, it's interesting, but it, it does uh, add some income. Uh, this is him talking to a group that's out there on a, on, on a soil tour. And then, because he had this dream, and he'd been through the Beer University at Anheuser-Busch, he wanted to do a microbrew. And I thought it'd be good, just because it's chaotic around our place, so. The beer thing handy is not a bad idea. <laughs> so Black Lake Brewery was formed. And I don't know if we'll ever make money on this, but it does create ambience for the other things that happen there. People love to drink, come and hunt and drink the beer that we made on the ranch. Come for a wedding, drink the beer that's made on the ranch. And uh, this is what it looks like. There's a lot of work. I never realized, you know, I just drank beer. I didn't worry about all this stuff. <laughs> But it does take a lot of his time, so it's, it's, uh, it's been interesting. We'll see where it goes. But he's really got some opportunity, and he's a marketer. That's what he did in Anheuser-Busch, and he loves this part. And so 1882, he, everything he, we do, we kind of relate it to the ranch. The ranch started in 1882, the lager beer come out with. And this is a beer that tastes like Coors Light, Bud Light. It's for us guys that drank too much of that and can't take the dark stuff as much. This is for us. And now NDSU, you know, the buys and NDSU's team, eight national championships, relates to our buffalo herd. And if we can, we're working on getting that into Fargo and NDSU, and we, I think we, we will. But there's NCAA pushes on us, and Jay's, Jay's uh, resilient, and so we'll see. But it's, it's fun, it's exciting, we'll see where that goes. That kind of brings me to the end. Merry Christmas, everyone. I, I really appreciate being here today. And that's my uh, email if anybody wants to get a hold of me. We're in the middle of this transition on our place. I've got a daughter that we've got to figure out, and we've had some of these discussions with you here. She's married to a cowboy that's a president of a bank. So they've got, they've got it made. He's, he's a non-traditional banker and kind of exciting to see that, you know, honestly. But she still wants to be involved. She gives me heck because I'm a girl. I got kind of didn't get, but then she, didn't, she lived in Texas five years. I said, you just can't waltz back and jump in the middle, you know, see how it goes. And so we finally, I was telling these guys here we hired a firm now to help us with it because you know the boys and all those kids grow up like this and then when they get married and they marry some non-traditional egg people that that just don't you know they, I mean they don't look at it the same now Jace's wife is a cowgirl from Montana so she gets it the other two and I'm not trying to be disrespectful to them they're great they're great girls but Little things become bigger things, I've learned. And then somebody said something, and even amongst your boys, somebody stole the marbles 30 years ago, and they're still mad. So we have a, <laughs> we have a business meeting, and the first half hour is, you remember when you took that, damn it? You know? <laughs> so, no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So anyway, this firm, they're, they're, they're really good at uh, helping us with the business structure, because we got a lot going on, and we've done some of it. We need some fine tuning. And then we're actually going to take the whole family through the disc and personality and then try to get this family dynamics. And we're all committed to it because I tell my boys every day, if you're not committed to it, all you got to do is look around this operation. I can point out six or eight of them that didn't do anything and they're either broke or it's all screwed up and they can't talk to each other anymore. And, and Renee and I have said that the worst thing we could do is not do this right, and then none of our kids will talk to us at the end. And I think all of you, you can relate to this stuff. It's not easy, so keep with it. And, and you know, I, I just appreciate the, when we're getting groups like Nancy and others that are digging in this, and Nebraska's doing a lot, and I really 
like what you guys are doing out there. So anyway, with that, thanks so much. And if, if anybody has any quick questions or if I took too long, cut me off. That's no, okay. no, you're good. We got time for questions. So anybody got questions? 25 miles. So they yeah. One thing I might add is I think every operation, if you're going to do something, start something, has an unfair advantage. You don't know what it is because it's hard. You're too close. You know what ours was, one of them? That, that international airport, 25 miles away. Lots of, all the hunters almost fly in, and so it, it really made a big difference. So it, it might be hard to see, but I think if, if you want to start something or try something. So do you have a herd of buffalo there? Yeah, we sure do. Yeah, we've got about 350, and then in the summer we run 2,500 cows. No, not yet. Yeah. Don't do that. Yeah, not on purpose. That's <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. Yes, sir. What are the minimums like for on fences to keep your buffalo in? You know, if the buffalo have water and grass and you don't bother them, they'll stay in about anything. But run them a little short or something spooks them, then it better be really good. You know, it, everything we, and, and they're on this one part of our ranch, everything we build new seven foot tall with five or six wires on it. And then we don't have much trouble with them. So it's, you know, it, but we, we've got them in some four wire fence again, if, if, if there's good grass and everything. But we had an interesting, if just, no, you're good. sometimes you're things good. go wrong, you know. <laughs> and the call you don't want is from the highway patrol at three o'clock in the <laughs> afternoon. There's a big buffalo bull going down Highway 83. Does it happen to be yours? <laughs> nope. <laughs> and by the time we got down there, he was heading towards the Missouri River. We've got a couple four-wheelers in the back. There's four of us in the dually pickup I'm driving. Anybody got any ideas? I said, because <laughs> he's mad, and he'd been down along the creek for three months, and what spooked them, I don't, we'll never know. Well, we ended up, we thought we, we found a corral, we got him in, trying to just ease him in the trailer, and he made two passes and said, this is a dumb idea, and away he went, and he ran past a couple houses, and I said, we're gonna have to shoot him, somebody's gonna get hurt. Well, we were too dumb to bring a gun. <laughs> so there's a guy there, help, that come along, he's got a 243. don't sh try to shoot a buffalo with a 243. We shot him eight times trying to hit that spot behind the head, and he's swatting flies, you know. So we, I called home. They brought a 7mm, and we put him down. It turned out good, and nobody got hurt. But it, Can you rotate those? The, the buff, the yeah, we are not as intense. I mean, they, they actually move pretty easy. You just got to, you know, don't pressure them like cows. Just let them figure it out, and they'll move pretty easy with a four-wheeler. Just, uh, yeah, we don't have much trouble with them until stupid things, but. <laughs> yes, sir? Yeah, so I sit through trainings, and, you know, of course, there's such thing as being too diversified. Um, I feel like my wife and I, as an operation, you know, we're just not getting any sleep. And, you know, right. But we've got three kids at two, five, and seven. So the plan is to have enterprises that they can kind of take on. Um, you bet. Right. Well, we kind of waited till they came back, and then what do you bring into the table? What excites you? I mean, not everything works, you know. And and uh, you know, so far the things we've done, they kind of complement what we're doing, and yet they add income when when cattle or buffalo or whatever aren't so good. But the main thing is to create excitement. You know, I think. That's, we, we can tend in agriculture to have blinders on. We're going to do it, especially on generational ranches. We're going to do it the same way. Granddad did it, dad did it, you know, grandpa did it. You're going to do it the same way too because that's the way it's going to be, you know. And, and I always said, my kids didn't grow up like me. They grew up with city kids. They know how city kids are. They don't really want to work on Sunday or, or even Saturday. And that's all right. You know, they do when they have to, but you've got to get your mind thinking on that. And, and we don't do very good at that. And, 
just like most of these programs are set up in a state when you go to for beginning farm loans or anything it's how many bushels of wheat you grow and how many cows you have you try to get a loan on a hunting operation or agritourism they they look at you like you've been smoking something too you know i mean it's it's unfortunate because if we don't go down this path we're not going to get you guys back and we're going to struggle with this you know, we get older, and then who's going to run it? Uh, do we want the the mega guys of the world owning all the crop land and the ranch land? We don't. So, so we need to work on this. So, thank you so much. Thanks, Jerry. Um, great presentation. It's, um, I just I envy all of the things he's got going on at Black Lake Ranch. It's really interesting. Our last presenter today is one of my favorite people. I should say one of my favorite attorneys because we can't say that about everybody. Um, Pam Olson is the managing partner of Pamela Epp Olson Law, which she established in March of 2021. Prior to that, she was a partner with uh, Klein Williams Wright Johnson and Old Father and practiced with that firm for 22 years. Uh, her practice focuses on uh, state and long-term care planning issues with an emphasis on helping farm and ranch families create estate and generational transition plans that work for their specific operation. She is the one person, the one attorney I've ever heard talk about these sorts of issues and put it in plain English. So I'm really glad that she's here. She's a rancher's wife, a dairy farmer's daughter. She gets it and uh, her and her husband have three children. Uh, three sons, 14, 10, and 7. So please help me and welcome Pam. Good afternoon. It's so exciting to be in a room like this and see so many people here thinking about these issues, talking about these questions. You know, when you think about the work that we do on the farm and the ranch, it's so complex. Um, it's so detail-oriented. It's so creative right? I don't know how many of you view yourselves as creative professionals, but you all should, right? Um, and when I talk with ag professionals about their plans, what are you going to do when you have a health issue? What are you going to do when you have kids coming back? What are you going to do when you die? You know, those are hard questions to talk about, um, but they're very, very important. We've got a smart aleck in the second <laughs> row here. So if y'all don't know that, there's a heckler up here with a formal Grazing Lands Coalition name tag. You want, uh, what's his name doing? Uh, Mozart doing now? Yeah. He decomposing. Uh, did, did you all hear that? What's Mozart doing now? He's decomposing. <laughs> That's almost as good as the lawyer jokes I hear. <laughs> Um, for a number of years now, I've been working with Nebraska's Grazing Lands Coalition to focus specifically on these kinds of questions. What are we going to do? How are we going to move knowledge to the next generation? How are we going to move assets, control, good management to the next generation? Um, and I've been working with them on a really unique format. Um, the, the workshops that the Nebraska Grazing Land Coalition puts on are for producers. Um, Nebraska's Grazing Land Coalition thinks about resourcing itself out by producers for producers. That's its goal. And so these workshops are all focused on producer, producer questions, producer practicality. So when I'm standing in the back listening to this, I'm thinking, you know, you sort of did a national Nebraska Grazing Lands Coalition workshop right now. Because the way these workshops work, we spend four or five hours in different spots all over Nebraska. Um, and we have partnerships with World Wildlife Fund, with the Nature Conservancy, uh, with Extension in Nebraska to get producers from those geographical areas in the state to those workshops to talk about these issues. And the gold letter bit about these workshops is that there's always a panel of producers who tell their stories. Much like you heard from Bill, much like you heard from Jerry, they talk about their stories what they've done, what they haven't done, what's worked, what hasn't worked, how life has intervened, because you know you can have the best plan in the world, and stuff happens, right? It just does. And so when you think about plans, you have to think about planning in a way that gives you um, as far-reaching a plan as you can reasonably see, 
with the recognition that you're probably going to have to tweak that. Sometimes you have to dump the whole thing and start over again because life really happens in a big way, right? So we're going to talk about some of those issues today. You know, this is my office a lot of the time. Now, mind you, this isn't really how my office looks. <laughs> this is the office picture for when I took the picture. The rest of the time, it looks a lot more chaotic than that. But this is also my office. As Nancy said, I am a dairy farmer's daughter. I grew up in southeastern Nebraska, about eight miles from the Kansas line. Bill, what we knew about Kansas, not me, but what my classmates knew about Kansas was the drinking age was lower. So there were a lot of people who drove eight miles south to do dumb stuff, right? Um, my husband and I farm and ranch in western Nebraska. So now we're 10 miles from the Wyoming line. This is High Plains Prairie. This shot is at the highest point on our ranch, which is just a skiff under a mile high. So we have cool season grasses. Um, this was in July of 2020 when no one could go anywhere, so we went up there for the 4th of July and camped overnight. And from that spot, you could see fireworks 360 degrees. It's beautiful country. Um, I keep this picture in because this is down, this is what we call down north. So this is about 700 feet lower. This is stockpiled grass. We AI on this pasture. This is not how it looked in 2021. I don't know if any of you know this, but we had a drought. <laughs> so I keep this picture in to prove to myself that the grass can be green. This is my husband. It's fourth generation um, Hereford operation primarily a commercial cow-calf operation. We're one of the primary test herds for the American Hereford Association National Reference Sire Program. So we breed all of our cattle to nominated bulls. We take those calves, the progeny from those nominated bulls, from birth to harvest, collect data on all of those progeny. We have a gross safe feed efficiency system on the ranch, so we collect feed efficiency data as part of the work that the ranch does. Um, I am wildly unskilled labor, that's what I am. I'm very reliable unskilled labor, but I'm unskilled labor. So this is my husband tagging some uh, a registered calf in our registered herd. We do have registered Herefords as well. I have a registered Hereford, registered Hereford bull sale every year. Um, we have a lot of crop ground too. So we do a lot of different things. Not as many things as Jerry does. I'm not sure anybody does as many things as Jerry does, but we do a lot of different things. We do have three sons ages 14, 10, and 7. And this is what we have um, tongue-in-cheek titled our generational monster. I don't know if any of you recognize that as a concept, but the idea is, you know, we work so hard. We work and we work and we work and we work. I said to my husband the other day, because someone had said something to me and I had never considered this, and I looked at him and said, do you think we're workaholics? And he said, of course. <laughs> of course we are, right? So this is our generational monster. We've got three boys. They all think right now that they want to come back to the ranch, but we don't know what they're going to do. Our family rules are, if you're gonna come back, you go away. You get a four-year degree, and then you can come back if we think it works for the operation and if you're prepared to do what is required to be a part of the operation, right? So the reality, though, is I think the big guy over there on the bottom He's probably going to be a preacher. Pray for us. <laughs> this guy right here, you know, he thinks he wants to drive everything there is to drive. This is him really driving the combine with custom combiners. They put him in there, and he just goes. He just, he's, got a, he's got a feel for it, right? But I don't know what he's going to do. And the little squirt over there, we don't have sheep. That was at the fair. The little squirt over there, I think, is going to be probably our rancher, if, you know, if a parent can guess. Now, the reality is what we would like is rancher, farm operator, vet or accountant, you know, pick one of those. What we might get are three proctologists. It's hard to tell, right? So, and we're at the point in that transition where we've built and we're building, but we don't know exactly how that transition's gonna look because we don't know what the Lord has in mind for those three men, right? And ultimately, he gets to decide that, not us. So let's see. Oops, I went the wrong way. Oh, because they're Herefords. He didn't get run over because they're Herefords, and they're, where, they're well handled. You know, you were talking about how you, push, you let the buffalo kind of go. My husband's quiet, calm. I knew I could marry him because when we were dating, I spent a lot of weekends out at the ranch to find out what my life would be like, and when I was at the shoot, he never yelled at me. So husbands in the room, <laughs> there's a standard for you, right? 
So when we think about transition planning, what do we think? Okay, this is a fancy way of saying it. Transition planning is planning through the entire process of deciding how your assets will be used during your lifetime and how they'll be used when you die. It's not one or the other, it's both. It can be one or the other, but if it's only about what you do while you're living or only about what you do when you die, it's not good enough. As part of the Nebraska workshops, we had a number of years ago a producer who participated on the panel and he told a story about what motivated him to get his transition planning moving. And the motivation for him was the death of a neighbor. A neighbor had died at upper 80s, early 90s. And neighbor's 60 plus year old son came knocking on the door shortly after dad died and said, I need some help. We got to wean calves. I don't know what medication we're supposed to use. I don't really know when I'm supposed to do that. I don't know how to handle all of these, what the producers in the room might consider to be very basic decisions about how to handle weaning, just one aspect of, of the cattle production. And he said, I made up my mind right then and there, not one of my kids would ever knock on a neighbor's door and ask that question, right? So for him, that was a very useful motivator. But you don't want tragedy to be a motivator, because if you are making decisions reactively instead of proactively, defensively, as opposed to offensively, they're not good enough, right? I tell clients all the time, I am much less expensive if you let me advise you as opposed to letting me defend you. Right? And that's this kind of concept. So in the context of farm and ranch operations, this is how you think about it. You think, first of all, about what the expectations and goals are of the owner of the operation. How many owners have we got in the room? Seriously, I won't call on you or anything, right? How many operators? How many owner operators? Got a few of those. How many employees? Yeah, <laughs> got some employees in the mix, right? Communication is key to a good transition plan. And you heard that already this afternoon. Bill talked about it. Jerry talked about it. You have to communicate as a group if you want to build out a good plan. But at the end of the day, the person who makes the decision or the people who make the decisions are who? This is audience participation now. Who? Who makes the decision? The owners, right? The owners ultimately have to make the decision. Sometimes the walk, wonky or rocky part of transition planning is that you may have owners who don't want to communicate. Anybody ever had an experience like that? Close your eyes and hold. <laughs> right? Yes, that can happen, right? There are folks in this professional world who are not so keen on talking about their business, right? And that's fair, it's just not always as productive as talking with the right people about your business, right? So it's good to know what the owner's goals and needs are. That's the most important criterion here. But as you're thinking about transition, you have to think about what the goals and expectations of that next transitional generation might be. And you have to about think about things like who else is in the mix? Jerry talked about that a little bit. What about when the in-laws show up? Everybody in the room who's married is an in-law, by the way. I'm a fabulous in-law unless you ask my father-in-law. I have no idea whether he thinks I'm fabulous, right? So you have to think about how that communication dynamic works. And sometimes it's possible to communicate effectively, and sometimes it's not. So when we think about a good transition plan, here are the things you have to consider, OK? Now, don't laugh when you read that first one. When you're thinking about transition, first of all, you have to know what you own. And you have to know how you own it, which sounds a little silly, right? But an example of that is this. How's your real estate titled? Is it owned by an entity? If it's owned by an entity, what you own is not the dirt, no matter how many times you say you do. You don't own the dirt. You own shares or interest in the entity. And does your entity have any buy-sell or transferability provisions inside its operating agreements that limit 
or control how you as an interest holder can move those interests when you die or how you can manage them during your lifetime. What if you own real estate as joint tenants with rights of survivorship? That means, in every state, by the way, I'm not just talking Nebraska right now, in every state, that means if my husband and I own our real estate as joint tenants with rights of survivorship and he dies, I get it all. File a death certificate with the Nebraska County Register of Deeds and I own the ground. And it does not matter what his estate planning says and it doesn't matter what his transition planning says, the title determines where that ground goes when he dies. And it also limits his ability to make decisions about that ground during his lifetime. So you have to know what you own and you have to know how you own it. You also have to think through transition issues. Transition is multiple things. Transition is both how do you do less, Bill, during your retirement? How do you, retirement. And again, you know, I don't know how many of you in here plan to retire. I think my father-in-law's plan is that he will go out feet first. And that's okay because that suits his personality, right? There are other people in this room because of health or other circumstances don't want to drop in the saddle, as it were. And they want to make decisions about control and management on a different timeline. So those control and management decisions necessarily have to occur during their lifetime. But it also includes developing an estate plan. And an estate plan that contemplates both how you manage your assets during your lifetime, because estate plans do more than just manage at death, and what happens after you die. And there's all kinds of cool things you can do inside the conversations about transition planning, during your lifetime, control management, transition, and at death. All kinds of cool things. But you have to be ready to answer some hard questions. And we're going to talk about those in a minute. The other thing you have to think about is tax exposure. I know everyone here loves the topic that is taxes, right? Yeah, it's great fun. Before I came down here, I listened to an hour and a half seminar on the Build Back America tax implications of things. It was delightful in every way. I was so excited to come down and see human beings. So anyway, so we're going to talk about a few of these things dependent on time. we got 10 minutes left, so we're not going to talk too much about taxes, but we'll talk a little. So let's talk about the hard questions. Okay, When you are talking with your planners about transition, and you do have to have some other people in the mix here, because the people in this room are experts on a whole lot of things, but you're not all experts on the law, you're not all experts on the tax piece of things. You don't have to be, you have to find the right people. You have to find the right people to help you with some of those questions. That's important, okay? So when you're thinking through the hard questions and you're talking to those people, these are the kinds of things they should be asking you, right? And you shouldn't have to ask them. I was at one of these workshops a number of years ago and this dear widowed ranch wife came up to me and said, well, how do you find a good lawyer? And I said, well, first of all, let's say attorney, not lawyer, because lawyer sounds like liar. <laughs> so, you know, and I said, you interview them, right? You acquire those kinds of professional services the exact same way you buy bananas at the store, right? It's the same thing. If you go to the store and you pick up a bunch of bananas and they're all moldy and brown and gross, do you keep them? And say, oh, well, I touched them. <laughs> oh, dear. No, you put them back, right? You look for something fresh. You do the same thing with your lawyer, with your accountant, if you have an investment advisor, whoever's in that professional mix, you ask them questions. I have clients who say to me, in fact, I just sent an email the other day with the answer to this question. Do you have clients who would be willing to talk to me about what it's like to work with you? There's nothing wrong with asking that. There's nothing wrong with asking a lawyer what it's going to cost for them to help you. They should be able to tell you that. So you can ask those questions. This dear lady said to me, well, I went to a lawyer supposed to be really good, and I sat down in his office, and he said, well, what do you want to do? And she said, well, that's what I'm here to you, for you to talk to me about. I don't know how to do this. And he said, well, I'll do whatever you want. What do you want to do? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ditch him. Brown bananas, right? I remember this on film. Yeah. <laughs> so, so when you think about talking with someone who's going to help you plan, the first question they should ask you is, what do you own, right? What do you own? Then they should ask you, what do you want to do with it during your lifetime? How do you want it to work for you? Then they should ask you things like, we're going to see if this is going to let me go. What about when your spouse 
survives you? What are you going to do about your spouse? And that can depend on a lot of different things, right? I told you I'm really dependable, unskilled labor, and I am. We breed every animal on our place, AI, and I thaw every straw that goes in every one of those animals unless, because it's all time breeding, unless we have a group of less than 10, which I started implementing when we had little kids and I had a car seat and a stroller and somebody on my back, and I said, I'm not coming down here and doing this if you don't have at least 10. <laughs> and so Douglas always looks for the 11th, right? He's always looking for that. But there's a lot of stuff I can't do. I can't pick the bulls. I know what he looks for, but I can't pick those bulls. I don't market the grain. I don't figure out the rotational anything or the chemical anything. We're no-till as well. I don't, I don't do any of that stuff. And I can learn some of it, but I actually have another job too, so I can't do all of it. So how are you going to plan for somebody like me or somebody who's actively involved or somebody who you know, is both not actively involved and likely to remarry? I know none of you think you can be replaced, but you can. So then what are we going to do with your assets when you're both gone? When you're both gone, where are they going to go? And how are they going to get there? And by the way, there are all kinds of cool ways to think about doing planning that benefits on operation kids and off operation kids without giving the off operation kids the life insurance and the on operation kids the assets. You can do more than that. There's lots of stuff you can do. But you got to work with someone who's willing to work with you and talk with you about what your goals are. Ooh, and the tax planning thing, right? We're going to do a little tax planning here. So currently, the federal estate tax, it's a unified tax, which means it governs both taxes that you give above 15, for gifts that you give above $15,000 a year per year per donor during your lifetime, as well as the amount of assets that you pass when you die. Spouses are special. There's no gift tax, no federal estate tax um, related to those spouses. But when you give to your kids, there are tax implications in place. Currently, every person in this room can gift up to $11.7 million in, at death. And as a result of that, over $15,000 a year annual exclusion gifting. You can give $11.7 million to anybody without incurring a federal estate tax. If you gift more than $11.7 million, um, you're going to have a 40% tax. So we care a lot about that tax, right? We want to think about mitigating and planning to avoid that tax exposure as much as possible, particularly for the people in this room who are typically, not always, but typically asset rich and income poor, right? I told somebody at the last Grazing Lands Coalition workshop we had, I'd met with an investment advisor last year who told me, sorry, told me that she was going to build out her portfolio focused only on high net worth ag people and that she was going to do her investment advising for them. <laughs> and I said, well, good luck, right? I mean, because those, when you have liquidity, most frequently, where does it go? Back in, right? You're doing capital improvements, you're doing capital acquisition, you're doing debt um, attendance, you're doing all kinds of different things, right? Some states have a death tax as well. Nebraska does. Nebraska is one of the states that has a death tax, so you have to be thinking about that. You also have to think about income tax, particularly in the realm of capital gains, because you've got assets that you're passing. And so all of these pieces need to be in the mix. We also need to be thinking about who's going to be in charge of stuff both at death and during your lifetime. Um, and by the way, who's in charge is not your oldest child because they're oldest, right? It's a skill set, right? It's not based on your luck of the draw because you came first. You don't get something special because you're the oldest. And by the way, some of the oldest siblings, I was the youngest sibling, so for those of you who are youngest siblings, you understand my pain, right? <laughs> Sometimes oldest siblings think because they're oldest, they know more and should get to fill in the blank, right? So you want to think about who has the skill set and who is the right person to do different kinds of things. And of course, you have to think about respecting the entity. That's all really important. We're going to skip past asset ownership and reviewing the entity. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about this before we're done, OK? We talked about this before just a little bit. But transition planning focuses on how are you going to move management and control on what timing. And as you move management and control, 
Are you moving management and control using entities and the dynamic of the entity? An easy example for those of you who have LLCs, one way to manage or transition management and test, you know, kind of test drive with who you have in mind, one way to do that is to make that person the manager of the LLC. Let them make the decisions. And you keep the voting control, so if they totally muck it up, that was muck with an M, if they totally muck it up, you can get them out and regroup, right? That's one example. There's lots of ways to do this. But you have to think about how you're going to do that and on what timeline. The timeline that is most frequently least useful is that, well, I'll let it go when you carry me out feet first, right? That's usually not the best course. Unless you've done a lot of training beforehand and you're confident in the dynamic between you and your, and your transition plan, you're confident that that dynamic will work in that kind of abrupt environment. Because you know most of us don't know when we're going to go, right? So abrupt is not always good. It's not good for the health of the entity, health of the organization, health of the system. You also have to think about how you're going to coordinate all those plans with your estate plan. Because you know if you try to do stuff and then your estate plan says something different, if those two things don't go together, one of them's going to win, but both of them won't. So they have to be coordinated. You have to know what your entity documents say to make sure you can really do the things you want to do. And you have to have some ability to recraft over time. Those things are very, very key. And with the right people talking to you about these issues, you can answer all of these questions. You know, I was talking to somebody before who said, well, you know, the issue was I wasn't sure we could make it perfect. You're not going to make a perfect plan. Any of you found a perfect bull? I'm serious. Have any of you found the perfect bull? Of course not. You have to change things out over time. You have to adjust based on results. And that's what you do inside transition planning, too. Yes, Lyle. If I get it right, what do I win? <laughs> <laughs> okay, excellent. Okay, so predictions on what's going to happen with the federal estate tax systems. Um, it's less wonky right now than it was because we've seen a third version of the build back, build whatever, the BBA, the current tax plan. We've seen a third version of it. Um, and that third version doesn't touch any of the federal estate tax numbers or capital gains the second time. The second version didn't either, so that's positive. Um, the current scheme for federal estate tax numbers was implemented in 2013, um, scheduled to sunset at the end of 2025. And this plan, you know, this touches the $11.7 million exemption amount. Started at 11.5, has a built-in inflationary bump, so every year it goes up just a little bit. In 2026, if Congress doesn't do anything to um, extend this plan. We're going to go back down to just over a little, over a little more than $6 million per person. Um, and so I've been predicting since President Biden was elected that I thought it was unlikely the Democrats would really touch those numbers because it expends political capital. They don't have a ton of that because they don't carry as many seats. They didn't sweep both houses. They took them, but they didn't sweep them. So my expectation was, and so far it appears that that expectation is reasonable, my expectation was they'd let it go on its own. And what happens after 2025 is going to depend a lot on who's in the White House and who is in both houses of Congress. Um, that's very normal. When the Republicans control both of those branches, you see a push up on these numbers, much friendlier tax provisions for purposes of people like you. When the Democrats control those branches, and this is not a political statement, it's just a statement, right? When the Democrats control those branches, we tend to see a push down. That's very normal, okay? Um, currently, they're not doing anything with stepped up basis, so stepped up basis remains in effect. I think it will continue to remain in effect regardless of what happens with the overarching numbers. The last time Congress attempted to mess with stepped up basis, they kept the screwed up, awful, negative, horrible, language, I don't have an opinion on that by the way, kept that in place for a year before the hue and cry was sufficient that they 
took that back out and put us back in friendly cap, cap gains language. So I expect that that will stay the same. Um, I think we're in a position now where we've seen enough change in the federal state tax numbers. We've been through changes on that enough times that it's reasonable to say that even if it pushes down, it's not going to go basement. It's not going to go basement numbers. You know, you heard some or maybe read some press that said, oh, President Biden, he's going to get a million dollars. It's going to be back to, it's not going to go back to a million dollars. It could go back to six million in 2026. That's possible. And we have some history to support that. But I don't think it's going to go lower than that. And my hope is that when they look at this again, they'll realize that it's much better for the economy for them to leave them, leave the numbers at the, at, the, at the level they are now. But I said, I think every estate planner, when President Trump at all passed that tax legislation, every estate planner said, woohoo, don't hold your breath. It's not going to stay, right? Let's use it while we can. So probably have time for one more question. There is. It um, depends. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so when do you use an LLC versus a trust versus other things? Okay. Throw in an LLC, please. I was going to ask, what's the difference between an LLC and an LLC? What are you doing? I've never heard of an LLC, well, so. I've got two LLCs, one LLC, and I don't know why. Wow. Ask your lawyer about that, because I don't know what an LLC is. Nebraska doesn't have that. Okay, so. The, the thing to, to differentiate in your mind is that an LLC, a corporation, a limited partnership, anything like that, those are really assets that you own. They're not an estate plan, and they may have transition plan elements to them, but only if you understand what you've done and you know how to use it intentionally, right? The estate plan, a trust, is part, is a piece of, can be a piece of an estate plan. And it is a piece of an estate plan that can be effective as part of transition during your lifetime, at your death, after your death, how, depending on how you use it. But the trust, again, assuming the asset, the LLC agreements, will allow you to control transferability when you die. The trust is a tool you can use to move those outward as appropriate to your plan. But the LLC is an asset. It's, it's, it's more for where, when you're living, but it's more about how you, how you, um, how you hold underlying operational assets. So it's, a, it's an asset of its own. How does a will compare to a trust? How does a will compare to a trust? So a will and a trust do very similar things. They control the disposition of your assets when you die. A will, however, requires court intervention if, if a will is what you use to move your assets to the next generation or to whoever will own them next, that's court, that requires court intervention, a probate process in your state to accomplish that transition. Subject to statutory rules, notice to creditors, there's all kind of stuff that has to happen inside that transition. If you use a trust to move your assets to new owners, the trust itself, if it's properly drafted and properly funded, can skip over that court proceeding because the probate process is about how you move a dead person's assets to their new owners. If the trust owns the assets, the trust doesn't die. A beneficiary or creator of the trust may die, but the bucket, the trust itself, doesn't die. It has a trust agreement that says, well, well, Pam's died. Who's the next beneficiary? And so you just use the trust agreement to move those assets. You don't need a court involved in that. So I just want to say to everybody here, not having a plan is not a plan. So please, 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 I really, I beg all of you, if you are um, in that ownership position, please, please plan, because we need that next generation to be back on the land. So with that, I just would like you to give a round of applause to all of our uh, presenters today. And if you, have, if you have other questions, I'm sure they'll stick around and, and you can ask them individually.